Hey everyone, I'm Menachem Lairfield and this is Zero Percent. Let's continue our discussion about the holiday of Passover. This week we'll explore the nature of inspiration. The whole point of the Exodus was to receive the Torah. If that's the case, why doesn't God just give the Jewish people the Torah right away? Why go through the whole ordeal in the desert? I want you to take a moment and feel the material of the chair or the seat you're sitting on. If you're driving, maybe, actually, you know what? If you're driving, do it anyway. We do everything else while we're driving. We eat, we text, we talk to our friend. There's no reason why you can't feel the material of the seat. And if you're a really cautious driver, you can feel the material of the steering wheel. If you're running, that might be a little more difficult. You can still feel the material of your clothing. Just feel something. And I want you to notice that experience. I would imagine, if you're a normal person, you're not just sticking your finger on the material itself, but you're moving your hand back and forth. Now, the reason you do that is if you don't, you don't feel something. You can't feel just by putting your finger on a material. In order to truly feel it, you have to move back and forth, essentially creating a new experience. The reason for this is that our senses are wired to only pick up on new experiences. And this is true with all of our senses. When you hear a sound and it's a constant sound, you start to not even hear it at all. You only end up hearing that sound when it stops. I grew up in Miami where we had hurricanes all the time. And I remember when the power would go out, and it's not just power in your house, it's the entire neighborhood, oftentimes the entire city or state that loses power, you hear this deafening silence. Where does that come from? What that tells you is that there's normally all kinds of sounds that you don't even notice, you don't even hear. I was once in New York for my cousin's wedding, and we were staying in a house at someone's house right near the Long Island Railroad. And a couple times a day, the entire house would shake and you'd hear this horrible, loud noise as the train would come in. And I remember asking the person who lived in the house, like, how do you deal with the sound? How do you deal with the noise? And he didn't even notice it was there. As we get used to things, we don't even notice them. I remember when we first painted the downstairs of our house. Every time I walked downstairs, it was shocking. It was so different. And then after a while, it just becomes the norm. It's something you don't even notice. It's the same with smell. Every single person, including you, every single person's house has a smell, whether you want to admit it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, everyone's house has a smell. But you can't smell your own house's smell because it's yours and you're used to it. The human body is wired to pick up on only new experiences and to crave new experiences. And it's not just with our senses. It's really with all of human experience. The Jewish people leave Egypt, and they witness the most incredible miracles through the plagues, with the grand finale of the splitting of the sea. In fact, Jewish wisdom teaches us that the lowest people in Israel at the splitting of the sea saw greater miracles and greater levels of prophecy than the greatest prophets who ever lived. So we saw, we witnessed these remarkable, earth-shattering, miraculous experiences. And then, can you imagine the anticlimactic ending of that story? They walk through on dry land as they see the sea caving back in and destroying their enemies. And then, then what happened? Like, what happened the next day? It was just being in the desert. And the desert is not just a place with lots of sand. Spiritually, the desert represents a place with no spiritual energy, just a place void of anything. What is going on? All of life follows these three phases. And we hinted to and talked about this a little bit in our discussion, our episode on love. And I think on maybe the Bar Bat Mitzvah or childhood life cycles. All of life follows these three phases experiences, this pattern of three. There's the first phase, which is a phase of artificial inspiration. 
It's the beginning of the process, like the miracles in Egypt. The second phase is a phase of hard work, of actualizing potential and making it real. That's a phase that's difficult. As the Jews walked through the splitting of the sea, and they ended up back on the other end of the desert, they had to work on themselves spiritually. They had to climb the 49 levels of spiritual purity until they had built themselves up enough that they were ready to receive the Torah. And then that brings us to level three. Phase three is the phase of transcendence, like the Jewish people standing at Sinai experiencing this national revelation. In a way, stage three is actually the same as stage one, but this time it's real, this time it's earned. The analogy that's given, and of course it's true within the analogy itself, the analogy is just one other example of where we see this phenomena exist in all of human experience. But the analogy that's given is in the conception of a child, and I think we may have even talked about this in one of our previous episodes. There are three phases. The first phase is the male phase. It's the phase of potential. It's the phase of uh, inspiration. It's the first phase, which is the beginning of the process. It's a phase of excitement. It's short-lived. The contribution, again, going back to the analogy of the male contribution to conception, is very, very short and very, very small. In that first phase lies the potential for everything that will follow. The next phase is the female phase, and that's the phase that takes the potential and actualizes it. In this phase, the potential begins to expand into tangible form, and in the analogy of the conception of the child, this happens quite literally. It's taking up space and time. It takes effort and difficulty. It's only when phase two seems unbearable when it seems like it cannot go on any longer, that it transitions into phase three, which is the birth of a child, which is the harmony of phase one and phase two. On one end, phase one and two are seemingly opposites. They're complete opposites. One is about potential. It's quick, it's easy, it's exciting, it's something from nothing. Stage two is expansion. It's, it takes time and space and effort. They seem like complete opposites, and yet the harmony exists in phase three. We see these three phases in all of human experience. Judaism teaches that the soul leaves the world of the souls where it really wants to be, where it's experiencing this easy, pleasurable experience, and it has to come down into this world against its will. In a way, the soul being in the world of the souls is phase number one. And then it goes into this world, which is a world of effort and work, where it gets down and dirty to earn its place. And then in phase number three, it gets to go back to the world of the souls and eventually to the world to come, where it can bask in the spiritual splendor of closeness to our creator. While that's happening, Jewish wisdom teaches that the soul learns everything it's ever going to need to know in utero. And I think we talked about this as well in a previous episode. But let's look at it in the context of these three phases. It learns everything it's ever going to have to know. And then, as the child is being born, the angel taps the child on its lip, and then it forgets everything it ever learned. And it has to toil through life to learn everything anew. What's fascinating is at the end of our lives, we're told that the angel that greets us is the very same angel. The very same angel who taught us everything at the beginning. The same angel is the one who greets us at the end to see what we've accomplished, to see if we have learned everything that we were supposed to learn, everything that we really learned once before. Childbirth. Here the baby is, the fetus is living blissfully in utero minding its own business. And then it goes through a process that looks like death, where it is being forced out of that cocoon of calm and serenity. 
and it's forced into this world. And then comes life itself. So in a way, in utero is the first phase, going through the process of birth, which again is difficult and is a real travail, is the middle process. And then we get life itself. It's amazing how the conditions of life are completely different, both in utero and out of utero. The Talmud says that that which is open closes, that which is closed opens. And this is so true medically as well. We understand that if you were to take a child after it's born and stick it in a condition similar to what it's like in utero, the child would suffocate and die. And the same is exactly true of a child in utero. When if you took a child in utero and it wasn't ready and you put it into the oxygen of this world, it would die. It's amazing how the lungs automatically open with that first breath. All of the conditions, all of the things change. Zooming out and looking at life from a bird's eye view, we see these three phases so profoundly in the phases of life that we start off with childhood. And we had a whole episode talking about this where we see this invincibility, this artificial, unearned excitement for everything and anything, this feeling that we can be and do whatever it is that life throws our way and whatever it is that we choose. And then we get to the middle phase, which is adulthood, what we like to call these days adulting with the hashtag. And in that phase, we begin to close that circle. We begin to recognize what are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that I enjoy doing? What are the things that I can use to make this world a better place? Instead of all of the exciting things from childhood that I wanted to do, I begin to focus my energy on the things that I should be doing. I begin to learn and understand what my calling is and where I can use my skills in a way that will be transformative. But as we mentioned, if I go through the middle phase thinking that I'm really in the first phase, I'm setting myself up for disaster. Midlife crises arise when I approach adulthood as if I'm still a child where I say, look at this, my life is half over. And I had this whole list of things that I wanted to do as a child, and I haven't done any of those things. And that's really depressing. It's really depressing to come to be aware of the fact that there is so much I wanted to do and so little time left to do it. But when I approach it as an adult and I say, I'm not meant to do all those things, that list was devised by a child, then it's not so bad. Because I have an awareness of the fact that I am now in phase two. My job is to work and to build and to create. And then eventually we get to old age. And in old age, I get to experience all of the excitement, all of the things that I was so excited to build. I get to experience the real version of it. I get to experience the fruit of my labor. I get to experience all that I've built. We see this as well when I try something new, something challenging. The beginning, there's this initial burst of excitement and adrenaline. And I'm like, oh, I can do this. And then it gets really, really hard. Then it gets difficult. And then this amazing thing happens where I break through the crisis. I break through the challenge and I get to the other side. And there is this feeling of accomplishment, this feeling of having arrived that I would never have if I didn't have the middle stage of challenge. So the question is, why would the Almighty create a world like that? Why create this system? Why not just let us all experience the euphoric excitement of phase one forever? The answer lies in the growth mindset. We understand with the growth mindset that it's all about the effort. If I didn't work for it, it wouldn't be an accomplishment and I wouldn't appreciate it. I wouldn't be godlike. I wouldn't be emulating the Almighty the same way that He is creative and He is the source of His own greatness. I would not be the source of my own greatness. And therefore, when the Almighty creates the world, He creates it in a way that I have to work for it. I have to put in the effort. It needs to be mine. So then, why even bother with phase number one? Why not just stick with phase number two? Let me work for it, and then I'll feel a sense of accomplishment at the end. 
If you recall from our love episode, and if you haven't listened to that one, you can go back after this and listen to it to hear more detail about the idea we're about to talk about. We explained that phase one is necessary because it shows us the beauty and how amazing phase two can truly be. The purpose of phase one is to inspire us to get to phase number three. It's a taste. It's a preview. The analogy we explain from the Rambam from Maimonides is like a person lost on a dark night. You're trying to get home, but it's completely black. You can't see a thing. And all of a sudden, there's a flash of lightning. And in that instant, the entire sky lights up and you can see everything in clear detail. But as soon as it comes, it goes. And now it's your job to reconstruct in your mind what you saw, to reconstruct the image in your mind now that it's no longer there. And then eventually another flash of lightning comes. And when that flash of lightning comes, you can course correct and figure out where you went astray and get back on track. And he explains that through life, we only get a few of those moments. The lightning will only flash a few times, but when it does, we need to hold on to that image. The purpose of phase number one is to inspire us to get to phase number three. Because when I'm in phase two, when I'm in the working stage, in the actualization process, taking the potential and making it real, it's really hard. And that's the purpose of inspiration. Inspiration is not meant to last It lasts exactly as long as you think it's going to. As soon as you think it's going to last forever, that's exactly when it disappears. Because then its purpose is no longer there. The purpose of inspiration is to inspire us to work towards something incredible, something great. If we think the inspiration stage is meant to last, if we think it's real, we're setting ourselves up for disaster. But if instead I understand the purpose of inspiration, I understand what it's for, I can harness it to give me the energy I need to get to stage three. I can get to the end of the story where it mimics the first, but this time it's real, this time it's earned. So the next time you're inspired, instead of saying, oh, this feels great, and waiting for it to pass over you like a wave, figure out a tangible step you can take right now that will help lead you towards step number three, even if you're not there yet. Begin step two with the memory of the inspiration.